Okay, we're here as part of the 43rd Annual Elmhurst College Jazz Festival, and uh, one of the privileges we have this weekend is having uh, Patrick Williams here. He's going to conduct his music tonight, some of it new, some of it from uh, some previous albums, and uh, just a, an honor to have him uh, on our campus, and uh, we've had the opportunity now to have a chance to talk to him. So welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Doug. So it's good to have you here. Great pleasure, believe me. Yeah. yeah it's great. And, um, Two Grammy Awards, four Emmy Awards, Oscar nomination, nomination for the Pulitzer Prize in music, and countless albums and TV show. Great, great career. How did you begin that journey in music? Well, you know, um, I'm probably going to tell you more more than you need to know, but <laughs> it it really um, started for me at about age three. Yeah. Um, my, I was born in Missouri and um, a little town in, in about south, uh, 60 miles southeast of St. Louis. And my father had um, these, these kind of albums of 78s. They were in a big band albums. Mm -hmm. They had, and they put them together in a kind of an anthology. You know, there were six or seven, uh, they, they were, uh, what do you call those old uh, vinyl? Were, but it was before LPs, right? Seventy-eight kind of art, and they had a. There was a Victrola, <clears throat> which was one right. of the original, and they would put that in the crib, in the uh, and they had these little steps, uh -huh. that so I could get up and crank the the thing, <laughs> and um, you know I listened to Harry James, Count Basie. It was all big band stuff, right? And so from a very, very early age, I, I just became uh, almost in, in second nature to be involved with the big band. I mean, it was just like breathing or something. So all through my career, uh, with all the other stuff, you know, as far as being a professional composer and all, um, the big band was always like home for me. Right, right. And every time I wanted to do something where I you know, wanted to reconnect, I'd do a big band now, every mm -hmm. time. So what we're doing here is like a, just another version of the same thing that I've right. done for many years. And I enjoy it, and it's great, and you've got a wonderful band. Yeah. So, it's terrific. so you were a trumpet player in the beginning, is I that was, correct? Yeah. yeah. Well, I started actually in, I think it was third grade, I played the clarinet, the trumpet, the vibes, uh, and all, and just messed around. But but uh, the trumpet kind of, you know, I stayed with that all through college, and had some very good teachers. My father moved into the New York area when I was in uh, fourth grade, mm -hmm. and we lived in White Plains, and then we lived in uh, Darien. And uh, being in suburban kind of New York, really, right. uh, we had access to some really good teachers. I had, sure, I had a couple of good trumpet teachers who were excellent. One. You know, I learned classical trumpet and, and played in jazz bands and all the rest, but I had a very, very good education and in terms of being able to play the instrument. And then when I went to uh, Duke University, right. um, the first thing I found, I mean literally the first day I was on campus was a big band, mm -hmm. which they had called the Duke Ambassadors. And it was started by uh, Sonny Burke and Les Brown. Ah, the so Sonny Burke was associated with Sinatra. Yes, right. Ran Warner Brothers Music. Yeah, uh, and um, wrote Midnight Sun. Uh -huh. Midnight Sun. Yeah, yeah. He wrote that. Anyway, um, the first two years I played the trumpet, and then the second, last two years in college, I led the band, played the trumpet. Uh huh. And we had a very good book. We had a lot of the stuff that Les sent us from his books, and there were very good arrangements by top arrangers. And the band was made up of uh, medical students, guys that had been off the road, undergraduates. It was a kind of a conglomeration. In those days, you didn't get credit for mm -hmm. jazz. It was all, mm -hmm. all off the books. Right. <laughs> you know? But we were working every weekend. I uh -huh. mean, we, had, we were working all over the place. And it was like a fraternity. Yeah, I mean, it sure. Was, it was very, we were all very tight. Probably the closest of fraternities. Absolutely. Yeah. It really was. And, I remember those days with such fondness. Yeah. And we had such a great time. And then you gravitated towards writing early on then. With well, what happened essentially was that we recorded um, 
uh, we had I had a kind of a demo recording of the of the band, mm -hmm. and we were going to take a we they, they used to send the State Department would send these college bands on different right. things, so uh, I went to New York, <clears throat> and I was going to meet uh, somebody at McCann Erickson Advertising to talk about the possibility of the band going on on one of these tours, mm -hmm. so I played the uh, record that I had, and the guy turned out that that. that he was a real jazz nut, and he was running the music for McCann Erickson at the time. He was a Yale graduate. He was a very bright guy. He was kind of like the East Coast version of Stan Freeberg mm -hmm. in the West Coast. And he was very witty, funny, and we got it all. We just hit it off, and and so he came down and really recorded the band. He brought Tommy Nola down from New York and everything. We and we recorded a concert, and, everything. and he was so enamored with this college band that uh, he hired me. Uh, he said, I'm going to start my own uh, uh, little music production company. I'm leaving right. McCann. And he said, I'd like you to go to work for me. And, and I said, gee, that's, that'd be great. Doing what? And he said, well, we'll figure it out. <laughs> so I had no <laughs> idea what I was even going to do. And I'd done some writing, you know, the usual theory and stuff that you do in college. But uh, I really had not, I had no way did I consider myself a you know, professionally capable writer. But in those days, in the 60s in New York, the scene was so active that we were in the studio uh, three or four times a week. Sure. <clears throat> doing commercials. Do, he had a record deal with Columbia Records. He was doing some things with them. And he was a pretty good musician and a very talented guy, but he couldn't arrange. He could only write the lead sheets and the right, tunes and right. all. And so, you know, gradually I started to, to write the arrangements. And I mean, I would go home and get out my orchestration books and stay up all night and all that stuff. But it was a wonderful way of, of learning on the job because of all the different things we were required to do, the combinations of instruments. And you were writing it one day and hearing it the next, pretty exactly. much. Pretty yeah. much, exactly. It yeah. was just a, so, you know, one day it would be strings and the next day it would be this and right. that. It was never the same. And so I, I, in about the two or three, three years, I think I worked with him there. Uh, I got a real crash course in, sure. in, in arranging, but you know, having said that, the players that we were working with were, at that time, were just the best in the world. I mean, they were. So if I if I messed something up, they'd they'd Many say, times they could we'll help take you care out. of it. <laughs> right, right. Don't worry about it. Right. So <laughs> you know, so I learned that way, but it was it was a wonderful way to break in. Yeah. You know? And then, how long did you? work in the New York area before you went to Los Angeles? <clears throat> I worked in New York from 1961 to 1969. Yeah. And then I, when I left, uh, Sasha Berlin was the guy's name, I left him and started my own little thing. Um, and I was doing commercials and all that, that's what everybody was doing at the time. And Steve Lawrence and uh, E. Gourmet, mm -hmm. uh, I, I met a guy who actually turned out to be a very important influence with, uh, to me with uh, an arranger named Marion Evans. Mm -hmm. He and Don Costa and a few others were really the top arrangers in the world. Right, right. And Marion was a really beautifully, or is, he's still alive, but I mean, he was a beautifully trained musician. And, and so he taught me a lot of things that I needed to know. Yeah. But one of the things he did was he kind of opened the door to uh, Steve Lawrence, because he'd done a couple albums with him. So Steve called me. Um, in the, this is about 1964 or five, and to do a, a ballad album with a big orchestra. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really the first, in a way, big kind of pop record project that I did. And that started an association with Steve and Edie that went for years. And right. um, that led to Jack Jones and other singers of the day and, you know. But everyone um, needs that first door open yes, right. in the business. Absolutely. Yeah. And you never know where it's going to come from. Right. It just, and you just got to be you know, ready at the time. You, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it's about. So then that, you became involved in other projects, obviously, and that kind of led to the TV and the film work that came? Yeah, I wanted to, once I'd, you know, kind of been in New York for, you know, I, I started to get the movie bug, primarily because Marion had, uh, you know, a really a very elaborate uh, uh, soundtrack album collection. Mm -hmm. And he was extremely well informed about about film music. I mean, he was a real student of it. Right. And uh, so he'd play me things, you know, by Eric Korngold, right. Alfred Newman, 
uh, Hugo Friedhofer, all these Those wonderful David movies. Raxon, yeah. I mean, all these guys. Right. And I'd listen to this stuff, and, and, and I mean, it really was, it was, I just knew I, I got to give this a shot. I mean, this is, this is crazy. Not to mo not that I had aspirations of being them, but that it was just the kind of music that I wanted to try to do. Sure. And it was also composing. I mean, it was, it was as opposed to just arranging material. Right. So <clears throat> I uh, made a couple of trips to California in, in the late 60s and worked for, uh, to do an album. Uh, I did an album with Laney Kazan, and I did an album with Jack Jones. And when I got out there, I met this agent uh, whose name was Peter Faith. He was Percy Faith's son. Remember Percy Faith? Right, sure. Yeah, he yeah. was his son. Very nice fellow. Uh, and he said, well, let me see if I can get you something. So about a year went by, and I didn't really give it. I went back to New York, and he called me, and he said, there's this little comedy called How Sweet It Is, directed by Gary Marshall and, and uh, written by Gary Marshall, who was teamed up at that time with uh, uh, Jerry Belson. Actually, Gary didn't direct it. A guy named Jerry Paris directed it, but they wrote it. And it was uh, James Garner and Debbie Reynolds. Uh -huh. So I went out to California in the middle of the winter, and um, I'd never really spent any time there, not really, and worked for about two months on this movie. And, uh, and I had a little beach house. A friend of mine was Billy Byers, who was a great writer. Yeah. He was a dear friend of mine. And the family, our wives, our kids were all, you know, deep, deep. Mm -hmm. So Billy had a, a, a house out in Malibu. And he said, yeah, you got to come out and rent a house out on the beach, you know, this is California. You don't have to be in some hotel room. Right. So we got a, little high, got a little beach house, and I'm sitting out there with my Bermuda shorts on writing this movie, and it's the middle of February, and it's 75 degrees. So I called my, my wife. We had three little kids, and we right. lived in Tarrytown, New York. And I called my wife, and I said, you're not going to believe this, but... I, I, this is great, <laughs> you know. This is really great. And she says it's freezing back here. And I said, "Well, you got to come out and check this out." So anyway, the, the movie went well, and I started to make a few connections. And and in, I was going back and forth, kind of bi coastal for a couple of years. But essentially, I never really went back. I mean, right. I just stayed. And it, and I was so fortunate because. Yeah, this was like the early, late 60s, early 70s, really. And each studio in that period, it was, the studio system was kind of broken down. They didn't have the staff orchestras anymore. Mm -hmm. But there were still remnants of that. Right, right. And um, each studio had a, a music director. Mm -hmm. And they were musicians. They were executives, but they were musicians. So there was Lionel Newman at 20th Century Fox. Right. Uh, uh, a guy named Stanley Wilson at Universal. Um, at, there was a big a company called Quinn Martin Productions that did a lot of the detective shows, Streets of San Francisco, and I was a guy there named John Elizaldi, a wonderful guy, good musician. Anyway, they were the ones who recommended composers to directors and stuff. And uh, the studios were still very active. I mean, Universal at that time was doing uh, 18 hour, uh, hours of, of primetime television a week. Well, Not to mention the movies as well. Right, right. I mean, it was buzzing. So there were a few of us that kind of got in because uh, uh, the, the, they liked us. Lionel, I got very close to Lionel and Stanley and all of them, and I started working a lot. And it was about that time that, you know, Dave Grusin was, was there and a guy named Billy Goldenberg and a guy named David Shire and all that. We were all kind of at the same time in, mm -hmm. that, in that area there. Yeah. And it was a wonderful uh, 10, 15 years because uh, it just, I, I just remember it was a blur. I was just working all the time. Right, right. And it was all different kinds of projects, you know, films that were romantic comedies or whatever mysteries. That, which demanded different kinds it, of music. Totally. I mean, it, yeah. it, and, uh, you know, detective shows. and, and uh, It was all, it was a very just a patchwork quilt of kind of musical styles. Yeah, yeah. Because that's what you are when you're a film composer. You're kind of a chameleon. I mean, mm -hmm. you just have to adapt to whatever the thing is. Yeah. Know? So it was It was a wonderful time. It, right. And uh, L.A. Was, was really fun. And, we, and then, of course, you got in then 
shortly thereafter, I guess, with all the Mary Tyler Moore productions. That was one of the early ones. Yeah. There was a, you talk about opportunities coming through the window. Um, we had, as I mean, we had three little kids. I mean, my little, they were five, four, and two yeah. years old when we moved. And um, we got a house in Santa Monica, and uh, I guess they were maybe, you know, two or three years went by, but it was still early 70s. And my, my <laughs> wife says, I met the, the nicest people the other day, uh, Joan Burns. Uh, you know, I said, yeah, and she, she's, she's very, really very nice. Her husband's a writer. I said, oh, really? Uh -huh. And I really didn't give it a, too much of a thought. She said, and you know, um, our, our, we had a Mexican girl that took care of the kids and stuff, so, and, and she said her, um, her uh, uh, nanny and uh, Consuelo know each other and all of this, and I said, oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's a <laughs> nice connection. So anyway, she said, well, I told Joan that you were a composer, and, and, and I said, well, that's nice. You know, I didn't. Well, about two or three months later, I got a call from Alan Burns. And wow. he said, I, I wonder we have dinner, you know, and, and because your, your wife sent me a couple of your albums. They sent those records I did in New York with the big bands mm -hmm. and everything. So, um, and I had a few credits. That, that right. Then. So <laughs> I went to meet Alan and, uh, and a guy named Jim Brooks. And they said, uh, we've got this pilot to do with Mary Tyler Moore. She plays uh, uh, ah. uh, in Minneapolis. It'll be kind of a, it'll be here, but it's, she plays a works for a television station and she's single and all that. So uh, we did the pilot, and you know um, nobody really had high hopes for it at all. As a matter of fact, it was it was pretty much the reverse. I mean, Mary was not on a roll. She'd come off a Broadway show that yeah. didn't do well. Um, CBS didn't have any big hopes for it particularly. But she had made her big initial splash with the Dick Van Dyke That's show. That's right. You know, but it, that had kind of, right. you know. And um, anyway, so lo and behold, uh, the show takes off. And and that started MTM, essentially, which right. was Mary and her husband at the time named Grant Tinker. Mm -hmm. And it became the most successful um, kind of, you know, uh, comedy, I guess you'd call it. Uh, studio in town. I mean, they were doing. They were just winning Emmys every year, and they were just setting the bar yeah. for it because it wasn't Mary Tyler Moore. Then they did Rhoda. Right. Then they did the Lou Grant show. I, I did that for five years. It was an hour dramatic show. Actually, it started as Ed, yeah. Ed Asner in a newsroom and everything. But all these were spinoffs of the original. The original. And then I did the Bob Newhart the show. Newhart, all of, which was also produced by them, I believe. Yeah, it? it was. Yeah. Yeah. And. Jay Tarsus was the creator of that and, and uh, directed a lot of them. And then I wound up doing a lot of things with Jay for the next yeah. 20 years. Yeah. So all of these little seeds that were planted in there. Out of that one of pilot. That one, well, yeah, it, it, it bore a lot of fruit. For and that me. went for a good stretch of years with all those shows. Oh, it didn't did, it? Yeah. yeah. It went for about 12, 15 years with one or the other. So for, would they would produce it when they were Doing those, would they do a show a week? Is that how they did it? Yeah, kind it was of? about. I think they did eighteen or so, yeah. or so, you know, for a season. Right. And they were shot in front of a live audience out at CBS. And so your there. work week would look like what? What you were doing that? I mean, you would get. Well, that was one of the things I was doing. I mean, the, you know, looking back on that period of time from the early seventies to maybe, uh, in nineteen eighty to eighty eight. Yeah. Uh, that, that period. Um, it was literally a blur. I mean, I had three or four different series that I worked on. Wow. Plus the films. Plus I'd do albums and all the rest. And, and at the time it didn't seem like, I mean, I was busy, but I didn't think I was going nuts or anything. But I look back on it <laughs> from my perspective right. now. <laughs> you know, you're lucky to be alive, you know right. what I mean? <laughs> you, know, right. you could have had eight heart attacks by now. Yeah. So anyway, but it was a great time. It was the, sure. the musicians were great. Tom Scott was part of all of yeah. that, and all these wonderful players. And that and beautiful theme on uh, Bob Newhart yeah. show. We talked Buddy Childers played. Yeah. He said, yeah. And Tom played the solo on the Lou Grant theme. Oh, he did. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. So so we go we go back. As a matter of fact, Tom was on. 
the very first How Sweet It Is, my very first movie, uh-huh. uh, Tom was playing in the woodwind section and he was 19 years old. Wow. So he was just coming he up? Was, he was yeah. the talk of the town. Yeah. Everybody was saying, have you heard this kid? Yeah. Tom Scott, you know? And um, he was he was like the, And then you started to use them on your things? Everything. Right. Yeah. I just used right. them on everything. Right. You know, we just hit it off. Yeah. You know. So your own albums. Big Dance, but you know, Threshold is a legendary album now, which was well, so hard to get for a long time, but fortunately now we can again. Yeah. It's, and on those albums, um, and, and some others, you would use just a few guys and they would create big bands. Right. How did, I guess what made you favor doing that, just so you could have everything lined you know, up? Or I, I don't remember quite why uh, we, we decided to do, I think the first one was uh, a thing called On the Sixth Day. Mm-hmm. And uh, at that point, there wasn't an album or anything. I just wanted to do some things. So I didn't have a deal or anything. So you were just going to write a few tunes and not necessarily, there wasn't an album concept there yet. Well, I was hoping maybe it will be, right. but we went over, and I remember we went out to this little studio in the valley, and I was paying for everything myself. Mm-hmm. And uh, so fortunately, the television shows were, <laughs> were helping me pay some of these bills. <laughs> right. But... Um, some of the guys that I worked with, like Buddy Childers played lead trumpet and uh, Billy Byers was still playing the trombone right. and, and that. And so I went out and wrote this stuff and um, I, for some reason or another, maybe it was a studio, was, was very small and I thought, I don't know if I want to put a whole big band in here. Or uh-huh. whatever. So, you know, you could do the layering. Thing. Right. That right. was still quite, you know, pro- uh, prevalent. So. Um, Buddy played um, the lead trumpet part, and I'd sing the chart to Johnny Garrett, drummer. Right. So he knew where the band was going to be doing the out chorus or whatever. He knew where the licks were. He could feel what the ensemble was going to be like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so we did the rhythm live, and uh, Buddy was in the booth playing the lead trumpet, but we didn't record it live. We just so Johnny could hear Uh the lead trumpet part. And uh, the solos were live. So Tom played his solos and all that live. Right. And then after we got that, it was very exciting. I mean, the solos sure. were, it was hot. Then Buddy put on trumpet one, two, three, four. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, Billy played trombone one, two, three, and a guy named Kenny Schroyer played right. bass trombone. And I think I brought in some French horns and put them on. and and percussion and everything and it was just like this flower was was growing out of the, you know it was yeah. amazing experience to hear this huge sound after we got it all yeah done. and and the reaction to it people just you know seemed to really react positively so i did the, the threshold the same way yeah we layered it and all of that and there was a <clears throat> uh, an a and r man we used to call him a producer at capitol records named neely plum and mm-hmm. Neely heard these two cuts and took it into a guy named Maury Lathauer Capital and they bought it. And so they, they paid for the rest of the album. Uh-huh. And um, yeah. you know, I did a thing with string quartet and a jazz right. rhythm section. I was really just trying the to witch, do some, that that? The Witch, is yeah, that yeah. The Yeah, yeah. And that had that beautiful Buddy Childers line it on it too. And then I got Marv Stam from came in from New York to mm-hmm. put on some jazz solos, and it was a process that took you know the better part of a, of a year really, uh, right? To, you know, and because I wasn't, that's not the only thing I was doing. I mean, I was mm-hmm. working along the side of that, and it you know when it came out, um, it 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 started to get this cult following. That's I right. Mean, it, that's it, right. It, it's, <laughs> So, which was, oh, I remember we listened to it like crazy when it came out. I mean, we were yeah, all I, over that album. I, I remember some uh, later on some guys who are now you know top pros in the business. I mean, um, but there was this. They were in college when this mm-hmm. thing was released, right? And I mean, I really had some touching moments where there's some really wonderful musician will come up to me and said, "Boy, that album that just." Blew us away. We listened to it and all that when we were in college. Yeah, I was in college at that time. <laughs> you I mean, well, was well. too. And it was always that really meant a lot to me. You know yeah. that you could have some small impact on a young musician's life or something. Yeah. But how did that album cover come about with the cigar? I wanted to do. I told the photographer uh, I want to do something that's not pompous. 
I mean, I don't want to present this as as some big experiment with some, cla you know, this classical music and jazz and all. Yeah. I don't want that. I just want it to sit, to be what it is and to let it speak for itself. And it, but it shouldn't. The cover should have an element of something it's like taking a risk. Uh, you know, something that you can fall off the end of the cliff, uh, maybe, if you don't, you know, get it right. And so he, he brought this cigar out, and it had the ashes right. were like this long, right. and the cigar was this long. That's right. And I looked at it, I said, how did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> so he had a wire in there, I guess. I guess. Oh, that's how it was yeah, done. Yeah, he had uh -huh. a wire in there. So uh, he said, go put on a jacket. He set up the thing, and we took some pictures, and that, that was the cover. It was it. Yeah, yeah that's great. Because yeah. I always wondered how those ashes stayed on. Yeah, everybody did. But yeah, I'm sure that's true. <laughs> I did, too, until he showed me what the trick was. So now you've got a, a new project going, which we're actually going to do some of the music tonight. Yes. And uh, you're with Artist Share, which we're is a different... with Artist Share, which is a new experience for me. I mean, right. I've never... Uh, all the how does that how does that all work with with them well I'm gonna have to let you know okay um, I'm hoping it's gonna work out well it, it's, yeah. it's a it's definitely a, a 21st century idea right um, because record companies as you know are pretty much non non really existent I right they're around but not they don't and so here we are in a whole new world of the internet yeah and ways to market uh, we're into social networking sites and all this stuff. And my actually, uh, my daughter, um, who's very musical, uh, two daughters, are both musical, but my middle girl, Greer, uh, has really got great ears. Mm -hmm. She was a cellist and everything. Um, she was the one who was, she went to Lawrence University in Apple, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. It's a very good small music school. She called me and she said, Dad, there's this guy, you've got to hear this guy. Matter of fact, you ought to sign him. You ought to get it, you do an album with him. Just get him right away. He's gonna be, he is incredible. I said, really, who's that? He, she said, his name is Bobby McFerrin. Uh, and I said, yeah, well, I'll keep an eye on him. She said, no, you should do more than that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I said, well, I'll keep an eye on him. I was kind of busy then and all of that right. stuff. Well, guess where, you know, he's, he, yeah. So that's the kind of ear she has. Right. So she 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 kind of got me aside last year because I said I want to do another big band album, all originals, and um, I just need to do one. I was like when we started talking, I need it centers me, it brings mm -hmm. me back to where I yeah. really feel I belong in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. And so she said, well, you know, Dad, you're just going to have to get in the 21st century. And she says, I know you don't really like all of it, but nevertheless, <laughs> you're gonna have to get there anyway. Right. And um, so she said, there's a whole new way to, to do this, to, you know, to market. And she's pretty on top of a lot of it. So yeah. she's set up the social sites, I'm a Facebook site now, and this and that, and Artist Share very much fits into this kind of uh, fabric. Mm -hmm. Because it, it's a website, and they're they're simply uh, uh, middlemen. Right. It's not a record company. They don't pay for the record. They, right. they just kind of facilitate, and they keep the the, the log, the, the sales, and all the rest of that. Uh, but essentially, what you're doing is you're you're sharing uh, your album with people who who just want to be a part of it. Right. Because they they want to be a part of it. Right. And so there's various levels of, of participation. And for each level of participation, you get something kind of special. Right, you right. Know, that somebody else doesn't get, necessarily. That's right. And so they're like... And you can just buy the album if that's all you want to do. Yeah, you can buy, yeah. buy the thing. But, but, or you can get cuts on it, particular songs, right. if you like, particular tunes. The, I'm going to make the arrangements uh, themselves available. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll probably do something like we're doing where I talk about each chart, right? why I did what I did, how I voice things, sometimes what I think about, because there's a lot of, you know, you know better than I, there's, there's so many big bands in colleges now, right? and the, the level of musicianship is very good, and, and the level, level of writing and arranging is excellent. 
So, you know, there, there might be a potential uh, market there for me sure. to, to, to disseminate some of the charts. But in any event, um, uh, this will be the kind of the first time we've done this other than I, I went over to Holland a couple of months ago and did it over there, but this will be the first time we're really going to do it with the, with yeah. the audience. You know, well, they seem to have a, a great, so Maria Schneider, as we had talked earlier, yeah. is involved with them, and I think you spoke with her a bit about it. She was the one who kind of yeah. told me about it. <clears throat> uh, she, we had, when I was the, the artistic director of the Henry Mancini Institute, which was a wonderful program, yeah. We had 85 of some of the best musicians in the world, young musicians. And we'd have top pros, and Maria came out t three times. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she was telling me that this is the first time in her career that she really thought uh, things were being handled well from a business point of view. Right, right. Because she'd gotten ripped off from the labels, yeah. you know, which is not an unusual story. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but anyway, she was the first one that told me about it, and, and I'm really looking forward to it. I think uh, we're going to record it at Capitol, mm -hmm. uh, which has got the best room in town for big band. Right. And, uh, you know, we're going to do it with all my, my friends. Yeah. And um, uh, Al Schmidt's going to do it. Yeah. And so we've got, Legendary. it's going to yeah. be, you know, exciting. I'm now, do you think, maybe you, have you thought, will you record this in the fashion you did uh, Threshold, do you think? You know, I was thinking about doing it that way <clears throat> initially, because people responded so positively to those records, mm -hmm. but I, I, when I did Threshold, I only did two that way. I did Threshold and Mr. Smoke, and, and uh, I mean, and, uh, well, there were three, actually. Yeah. But now I'm going to have six. Right. And, and they're pretty long and well you know you've right. you've heard them I yeah mean, and uh it's very time consuming we keep going back and, yeah, yeah and sure. all of that yeah. and the rhythm section first and the whole yeah. way and then logistically it's like yeah. you're going to need players in and out and it, it to me i think um i'm just going to put together a great band right you know and let's just go in and get it done yeah sure because the kind of players that i I'm going to use like Wayne or anything right. like that. And Sinatra Land was done in the exactly typical the same, straight ahead exactly. big band fashion. Went into yeah. the, just did it. Which sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's the way we're going to do yeah. it. It just, it, the logistics of, of doing it the other way with all this music, I just right. think would be too much to go through. So you had the, I guess you'd call it an honor of doing Sinatra's last couple of things. How'd it was. I mean, it, it, it didn't start that way because he was very, um, reticent about the whole idea and, mm -hmm. and Phil Ramone who was producing it um, had and, and you know his management and the label and everything were excited about the idea that they could get him back in the studio because he had he had not had made an album in years yeah and you know his son tried to get him in and all that and he, and he wasn't going to do it I mean and the reason was if he he, he just wasn't going to do something he didn't think that was going to be really good yeah yeah. He had such pride in what he did. Right. So, um, anyway, uh, they talked him into, at any point in time during the process of the duets, albums, he could say, no more. He could, I'm not going to do it. Huh. And he could kill it. I mean, he could, they did destroy the tapes, whatever. He had total authority to right. say, this is going to go forward or not. Right. And so it was like a little like everybody was not sure exactly what was going to happen. And he didn't really get the idea of the technology, or he knew it, he, he could understand that you could do duets with people and not be in the same room. Right, right. As a matter of fact, it, it, it was pointed out to him that most of the contemporary duets are really done that way because of people's schedules and this and right, that. Right, right. And with the, with the uh, uh, technology, you can hook a studio up in London with a studio in right. L.A. or whatever. So uh, he kind of got that part, but he wasn't totally convinced that it would be, you know, something he would want to... kind of experience he wanted to be involved yeah. in. Yeah. So the idea was we record all his vocals first. Uh. So they flew me to uh, uh, three or four places where he was performing so that I could get a feeling of the, the tunes that he was currently doing in his act. Mm -hmm. You know how many arrangements he had in his book? 
I can't imagine. It has to be a lot. 1,750. Wow. Man. Yeah. That's a library. <laughs> You're not kidding. And by the best and, rangers in the world. Yeah. I mean, it was, a matter of fact, there's a kind of funny story because I called Terry Woodson, who's got the library, who's actually yeah. my copyist, too. And I said, Terry, uh, I want you to send me, uh, uh, you know, the, the, so the bulk of the library so I can just look through and we can kind of cherry pick and see which arrangements, because there are four or five arrangements of the same song sometimes, you uh -huh. know, at different periods. Yeah. And, and he laughed. And I said, what's so funny? He said, the 750, 1,750 arrangements <laughs> right here. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Well, we don't, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So we traveled, I traveled around, and he, he was, you know, he, it, he was 78. And sometimes he would sound really good. I mean, mm -hmm. he, I went to Las Vegas and heard him at Las Vegas. He sounded great. Other times it was a little not so, you know, he'd shake, shaky a little bit. Mm -hmm. he, and he needed the teleprompter and he'd, you know, forget the right. words. And, but they still felt that he had enough in him that with... You know, if we could get a few really good takes of these things, just right. we could we could fix it in post production, as they used right. to say. So um, we booked Capital, and I rehearsed 32 charts before he showed up. Just the band. Just the band. Not 55 even at all. piece yeah. band. And um, uh, after we'd done that, and he, by the way, he heard what I was doing, so he was cool with that. We had a great band. Mm -hmm. So, and Al Schmidt and all of that, and Capital, his favorite yeah. place. So we had that going for us. And he came in and the first night, he, he, he was going to, he likes to record from six to nine at night. And he came in and he said, uh, I got no read. I got no read. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. He says, I can't, I can't make it. I got no read. Yeah. So he left, and the whole band's in there, you know. So, wow, was, everybody's okay. sitting well, there. Yeah, oh yeah, and and you could hear a pin drop when he walked in. I, I mean, it was it was really some feeling when he walked in. Yeah. And um, so anyway, he turns around and walks out, and okay, and that was so the first night. That was the first night, and couple of nights, I think that it was the next night or maybe they gave him something or the night after, but he got his voice back. I tell you personally, I think he was actually nervous. Uh -huh. I don't think he'd ever been that nervous about, but I think he was nervous. Yeah. It was, it was like, what, what am I getting myself into here? So he came back in and he had his voice back and he was ready to go. And he was got a sport jacket on. He looked great. And they, they didn't really. Uh, he they, they they built a booth for him, that they put in the middle of Capitol. The booth cost I was told thirty five thousand dollars. It was just built for that. Just for him. Yeah. And it looked like a living room. They had a couch, a couple of chairs. They wanted to make this wow. environment for Frank. You know, microphone. Uh, place for his cigarettes, so he'd just sit in there like he was could relax, and then he'd get up yeah. and sing, you know. So he walked in. I was standing there with Bill Miller, his piano player, mm -hmm. and he, he walked by us and walked in the booth. Man, he wasn't in there five seconds. He just turned right around, and he came up to Bill, who was standing right next to me. So he was, and he says, "I'm not singing in there. I want to sing out in the room with the band." Which is what he always did. Yeah, right? always sang with the band. Right. So, wow. That okay. Now they're going to have to get boot, this booth issue is right. uh, not going to happen. So there was no real plan B. Right. Nobody had thought what happens if, if he doesn't like this booth. I mean, so now there was this. How we got to get? How are we going to deal with? It? We're going to hang a mic. And blah blah blah. And about ten or fifteen minutes of conversation was going on. He gets up and leaves. <laughs> so he's not sticking around for that, you know? Oh, boy. And his, and his manager's chasing him down the hall. Frank, no, you know, don't go, yeah, right. don't go. He's right. like, oh, no, no. So we had this big meeting at Capitol the next day, and they decided they would set up a little kind of 
stage with a gobo around it, so he'd feel like he was performing. And Phil or Al, both of them, had found this microphone that he could hold, hand mic, uh -huh. uh, which he liked to do. But the leakage factor w was a big deal because sure. we're going to have to put duets over this and yeah. other singers. And if you have leakage, you're just finished. You can't do right. it. Right. So this microphone was incredible because it could be right in the middle of the room with the band and all that kind of stuff. And for some reason, there was no leakage. And so he could he could uh -huh. use this like he was singing a concert. Just like use it a gig. They yeah. put up his teleprompters just yeah. like he was performing. You know. Right. And. Um, so anyway, he came in and, uh, uh, after we finally got all this ready, and um, we were told everybody was to be six o'clock. Everybody was to be there. There were to be no pictures. Uh, nobody was to talk to him unless he said something to you. And if he did say something to you, you didn't say that much back. <laughs> uh, I mean, this was really CIA stuff was right. going on here. There were no guests, you know, yeah. all of this kind yeah. of stuff. So he came, he came in and uh, sat down, it was 10 of 6, and he had on his, I remember he had on a really nice looking blue uh, blazer, a mm -hmm. tie, and he sat down on this chair, and I mean right in front of me, and I'm at the podium here, and I've got all the charts ready to go. Right. <clears throat> and so the clock is ticking from 10 to 6, to 5 to 6, to, you know, we're just sitting there, and the band is sitting there. And it was one of the it was one of the most intense ten minutes in the studio I've ever had. But nobody played a note. I mean, it right. was so quiet. Wow. Nobody was talking. Right. The booth was nobody was talking, and they had two uh, forty-eight track machines going the whole time. So wow. it was always go everything was re being recorded. Yeah. Everything. And um, it was an amazing feeling. And I'm sitting there looking at him, and I mean. What I'm thinking, God, I'm not believing this. Am I actually here with it? <laughs> this is surreal. And uh, I'm, now I'm getting nervous. Right. And um, I mean, I'm sitting about three minutes of six, and I'm feeling like a, a waterfall under my <laughs> under my armpits. You know, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> yeah, right. and, man, I was, you know. Uh, I was very experienced. I mean, yeah, I'd, right. I'd done a lot of stuff, but I, I, so I thought, well, you know, why would you be so nervous with it? But there was something about the the moment, about him, oh, about sure. the whole thing. It was it was intense. So anyway, they said. He says he turns to me. It's exactly six o'clock, and he turns to me and he's, "What do you want me to sing?" <laughs> like with an attitude. How do you answer that? You know, it was a, there was an attitude to yeah. it. And I, I, uh, uh, I did one of those. Yeah. Uh, well, I uh, uh, <laughs> just didn't have, a, have an answer to that. Right. So uh, Hank Catania, who was very close to him and was co-producer with Phil, said, why don't you sing Come Fly With Me, Frank? He says, shoot, let's go. Right. You know, he was, that was what it was. Yeah. Let's go, let's go. You know? So I kicked the thing off, and it's the Billy May arrangement. Uh huh. Right. You know, and I hear that intro that right. I've heard since I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. And that chart that I've heard since I was, you know, right. in high school or something. Yeah. And I'm waving my arms. I'm thinking, this is absolutely. I'm not believing this. You know, yeah. this is not real. Yeah. And he comes roaring in, you know, come on and fly. With, and he's having a, he's singing and everybody's like, my God, he's going to pull this off. And he, he did a couple of takes and he says, what's next? And he was having a, he was enjoying himself. Um, he was on top of it. Uh, he sang seven tunes that night, recorded seven tunes. They were hoping to get two or three. Wow. Yeah, man. he was rolling. And then he sang seven or the next night, and four the next night, or five. And they wound up getting two albums out of it. Right. Because well, he sang so many tunes. Yeah. He, I mean, he must have sung 28 or 29 songs. And, and uh, they were just, you know, couldn't be thrilled. I mean, they were hoping that maybe we'd get yeah. 11 or 12, you know. 
but he was on he was just great so once you got past that first tune it had to be fun oh it was everybody was just totally in the moment yeah right with him right you know? and, and did um, he kind of loosen up then once oh, he yeah, felt that he, he was he was he was cracking jokes you know yeah. uh, saying he has these funny lines and he stuff I'm sure he used them a million times but he was enjoying himself yeah and that was that meant a lot to me sure and um, you know I, I you know I told my wife after the, on the last night I said you know come into the studio she said I thought there weren't any visitors I said don't worry about it he's in a very good mood this is the last night that you're gonna see Frank Sinatra in a recording studio yeah you gotta see it you yeah. just gotta be there so she came in and sat in the booth with uh, Barbara my wife. and you know it was like here we are at Capitol yeah. On the very last night that Frank Sinatra was going to make a record. The last night he would record in there, ever. You know. And I mean, it was, there was a powerful feeling of everybody, sure. of, the, of the historical significance of this. And he had done so much in that room. Oh, yeah. I mean, all the great records in right. that room. Yeah. And uh, like somebody said, if these walls could talk. You know? <laughs> yeah. But uh, it I was, was in there once, and I remember walking down that hallway with all those pictures on the yeah. set. And, yeah, Dean and all yeah. of that. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I got to meet Al Schmidt. He was in there, and, and yeah, it was something. But boy, it's it's a room. Boy, you walk in there, oh, and you just oh, yeah. look around. Yeah, and one of the best natural uh, echo chambers in in the world. Yeah, it's underneath the building somewhere. Right. But I mean that there's a sound to the Capitol echo. Yeah, that's just not, you don't get it anywhere else. Yeah, it's yeah. really unique, and it was perfect for a big band. Right, there's a roundness to it or something. Yeah. So the horns really have this real um, meaty quality to them, yeah. you know. Some of these studios, it gets kind of tinny. Yeah. They get kind of trumpets, you know, that piercing kind of stuff. Capital, you get this round sound to the brass. Yeah. It's really wonderful. So all you've done, and you still <clears throat> seem to have an interest, a strong one, I mean, what we've sensed here the last couple of days in, in education. Oh, yeah. Helping young musicians. And, yeah. Uh, I, I've always enjoyed it, you know. Yeah. I, I, I think from pretty much the time I, I got out to California, I started doing clinics and big band festivals and this and that, and, and uh, you know, going to schools for two or three days at a time. And, mm -hmm. and then I went to the University of Utah actually for one year. I, I was there one week a month. And there was a guy named Bill Fowler mm -hmm. who was very much in the forefront of jazz education. Right. He and Leon Breeden. Mm -hmm. And Bill, uh, and, and the idea was to have, this was after I'd done Threshold and a couple of things, it was right in that period of time, was the idea was to encourage, they had 96 jazz majors in the mid-70s, and the idea was to encourage them to do uh, things that are outside, as they call them, outside the box, mm -hmm. do creative things, you know? So if, if they had a composition uh, a major or uh, somebody who had, was pretty skilled in writing, uh, I would encourage them to write a, if they were a guitar player, to write a piece for guitar and string quartet and jazz rhythm section. Or try to mix things up, you know. Instrumentation, use interesting groups of instruments. Um, and so I did a year of that, and then Bill moved to the University of Colorado. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of moved with him. And that's when we did, uh, they had this thing in 1976, they had a bicentennial, it was a bicentennial year. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, they had sure. All these concerts celebrating. Right. <clears throat> well, they did a thing called Colorado Fusion in Denver. And we had a big symphony orchestra made up of people from the Denver Symphony, local band music directors, some students, graduate students, and all that. And I brought in Tom, Dave Grusin, uh, a bunch of players from LA, and and we did, we premiered a number of pieces that were written by students mm -hmm. at Colorado Fusion. I wrote a piece called The American Concerto right. uh, and recorded it there. <clears throat> it was the premiere of it. And it was a 35 minute piece for, three movement piece for jazz quartet, symphony orchestra. <clears throat> and uh, you know, the year was just really, we did a lot of really f entertaining and, and I think good, good things. And uh, it kind of led me to 
uh, after working with Bill to, to other schools where I'd go in on a limited basis and try to do some of the same things. Yeah. It's really, you know, try to stimulate uh, young musicians to, to really explore them, the things, you know, to explore right. your, where you think you can take this. And uh, I did it for a lot of it for about 20 years. I yeah. don't do as much of it anymore, but I still do so. Yeah. You know? well, that's great. I'm glad to be here with you. What's sure. that? I'm glad to be here with you. Well, we, we're glad you're here, believe me. And, and you know, it was just uh, just an idea that I sort of had and it worked out. Well, I'm glad it did. Yeah. You know, and I'm also, I uh, think the timing of it was great because I have the new things. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it was exciting to come and hear the new things. Yeah. When we first talked, you said, well, I have these new things. I'd like to do some of them. I said, yeah. send them out. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Great. Well, Pat, thanks for taking the time today. Oh, listen, Boy, just. I love uh, it. My great pleasure. to this has been talk with you, experience. and I know our students will have a great time seeing this. You video. have, by the way, you have a, you know, I know you know this, but you have one of the best programs around. You really do. Well, thank it, you. It was everything was handled that that you handled all the way along the process. What was just couldn't have been handled better. Oh, I mean, that means a great deal from you. It's for sure. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Yeah.